part three protein structure and function in foods and today we're going to talk about enzymes so at the end of this video you'll describe the function of food enzymes for improving structure and function of foods and changing food composition you'll describe how enzymes work in food systems and we're going to focus on outcomes based approach back when i was in my undergrad we had to sit in and do all these line weaver burke and michaelis menton um, equations and that's really awesome if you are going into graduate school or you are going to be studying the biochemistry for most product developers, you need to focus on outcomes. Are you getting the desired end product in your food? And I'm going to focus on that. And there's lots of resources out there for those of you who need to understand enzyme kinetics. We're going to list a range of common food enzymes used in food product development and food safety and quality. Some enzymes are good, some enzymes are bad. Um, and so we're going to discuss the difference between the two and just name some. We'll define how food enzymes are modified for their activity, either accelerating or deactivating enzyme activity by modifying process parameters or formulation. So just like we talked about in the previous video, when we're changing pH, when we're changing salting conditions, when we're changing the ionic characteristics of our food, we can change the enzyme attributes within our food as well. And that's why uh, when I discussed how all, uh, all sorts of enzyme kinetics are really important. The challenge with food systems is that they are um, soups of all sorts of different uh, competing interactions. And as such, it's often difficult to overlay the, the biochemical principles that are discussed so frequently into the messy, messy, messy scenarios that are seen within food systems. That's why I do focus most of my attention on outcomes based and knowing that there are lots and lots of biochemical resources available if you need to learn the biochemistry, but knowing that it's difficult to overlay that biochemistry in most food applications. So, food enzymes. What is an enzyme? Well, it's a protein. Yay, we have been talking about proteins. These proteins just happen to be sort of little, uh, little factories within, within the biological systems that make up food. And enzymes, in essence, are ways of catalyzing chemical reactions that occur within biological systems and they reduce the energy required for that chemical reaction to take place and so in essence the enzyme is going to hold the the key uh, molecules that are occurring within that chemical reaction in a way that then decreases the energy necessary to make the reaction occur so when we say delta G, we're looking at Gibbs free energy, the amount of energy necessary for a chemical reaction to occur. And in the normal situation, the free energy necessary would be quite high. In the case of enzyme stabilized reactions, we are reducing the amount of energy necessary for that reaction to occur, thereby making it easier for that reaction to happen. Lots of enzymes are awesome and lots of enzymes we want to denature. And so, in some cases, we want to get rid of the enzymes that are there, and in other cases, we want to add enzymes and make sure that we are not inhibiting them within the food systems that we have. So as I mentioned, uh, in essence, an enzyme is a protein, and it's going to take the enzyme substrate, so the core molecules that need to be modified by the enzyme. It's then going to have a binding site or an active site that holds that substrate, and that Holding is what allows for the reduced energy of the um, chemical reaction. The fact that, though, the enzyme has this binding site means that in some cases, in some cases, that's going to reduce the rate of that reaction. And in other cases, enzymes can be quenched because the binding sites get locked up and you can't do anything more. You can either add more enzyme or you have to wait. And so enzymes are wonderful, but you in some cases have to be patient with them. So substrate locks onto the enzyme and then that reduces the energy that's needed for the substrate to convert into what it needs to do. In some cases they're additive where you're taking two, two uh, smaller particles and creating a larger molecule. In other cases, they are going to be reductive. So you're taking a large molecule and you're 
breaking it into smaller molecules. So, as I mentioned before, there are a number of different kinetic principles, and I encourage you, if you are really interested in this, to look up Michaelis Menten, Lime Weaver Burke, or Edie Hofstein uh, enzyme kinetics. I am not going to spend a lot of time on that. Why? Because the challenge with food systems is that we don't have clean systems, and these kinetics don't work as well as we like to think in most food systems, because foods are wonderful messes of all sorts of different molecules, and the kinetics that we are observing here work very, very well in clean and very pure systems, and then we throw pH and salt and a little bit of cross-contamination within the plant. Don't cross-contaminate your plant, but this is why the enzyme kinetics that are observed here are, they're above and beyond the scope of what I need to teach within this college program. So as I mentioned before, what impacts all those enzyme kinetics? Time, temperature, salts, and inhibitors. And most food systems are full of time, temperature, salts, and inhibitors, which is why just focusing on the enzyme kinetics doesn't make as much sense as focusing on the outcomes. So what are the products of these enzymes and how do we measure the products and the functionality and the desirability of that product for the consumer? So let's jump into some enzymes. Some of my favorite enzymes, there's, there's quite literally hundreds, if not thousands of food enzymes that are out there, but there's some that just uh, get the best, um, get a lot of play. Polyphenol oxidase, this is one where in many cases, we want to get rid of this enzyme. Polyphenol oxidase is found in lots and lots of plants, and it causes the browning that we see in fruits and vegetables. So if you've had a banana that has gone brown, it's because of polyphenol oxidase. So we've got all these different uh, flavonoids that have uh, phenol groups within them, and using polyphenol oxidase plus copper and oxygen, you can form all these melanin type products or brown pigments. And that's not a bad thing. These brown pigments, these melanins actually have good antioxidant properties, but in general, most people don't like the browning occurring that you see in fruits and vegetables. So you'll see it in uh, bananas, in apples and so on. And a lot of the plant breeding that's going on in uh, places like our, uh, our center down the road, uh, Vineland Research and Innovation Center, is looking at reducing browning reactions within fruits and vegetables because of the uh, the shelf life reducing um, aspect to this. If we could figure out how to keep a banana yellow for a long period of time after taking it out of controlled atmosphere, that would be really quite interesting. Or if we could slice an apple and have it in a prepackaged snack pack for children's lunches, how can we keep it from going brown? Well, in some cases, we can take advantage of natural inhibitors. Acid is a natural inhibitor of polyphenol oxidase. Um, ascorbic acid or vitamin C is also a great inhibitor of polyphenol oxidase. And we can take advantage of ingredient-based strategies, but we can also um, do genetics and breeding to reduce the polyphenol oxidase intrinsically within the plant source. How about lipoxygenase? This is an enzyme that catalyzes the peroxidation of fatty acids. So it takes free oxygen and causes rancidity and flavor in food products. In, some, in a very small quantity, lipoxygenase within soybean products can create desirable bellini flavors, and in other cases, they can be a bit of objectionable. Lipoxygenase can increase the rancidity of a product too. Lipoxygenase is often used as an oxidation mechanism to um, bleach flour or to change the uh, nature of vitamins within food products. So lipoxygenase is in, in the right situations desirable and in the wrong situations not desirable. In the case of soybeans and tofu, for example, Soybeans and tofu um, have been used as food products in Asian cultures for millennia. And as such, the lipoxygenase beanie flavor is very, very commonplace and actually, to a certain extent, desirable within these products. People expect their foods made of soybeans to taste like soybeans. Here in North America, where 
the consumption of soy products has been a much shorter uh, period of time, soy milk and tofu, North Americans have found that the beanie flavor is objectionable and soybean breeders in North America have bred soybeans that do not have lipoxygenase or what are called lipoxygenase null beans so that North American tofu and North American soy milk has a bland flavor to it. Whereas in, in Asia, it's going to taste very beany because of the lipoxygenase positive beans that are used. Lipases. Oh, I've shown this picture of cheese before, but lipases are enzymes that are going to cleave off the fatty acids from triglycerides. So if you remember from our, our discussion about fat, fat is a glycerol backbone with three fatty acids. So try, try like tricycle, three fatty acids on there and a lipase will cleave off those free fatty acids so that they can participate in other reactions and or in other cases be more readily oxidized. Lipases can be negative, but in general uh, within certain food products such as, um, so if you have lipases within let's say olive oil or soybean oil, it can cause a lot of um, reduction of quality and in particular reduction of frying quality in, in these fats. In the case of cheeses, some lipase is good and, and actually some cheese makers will buy lipase as an ingredient in, in particular some of the Italian goat cheeses and sheep cheeses. Lipases are seen as desirable for creating the flavor profiles because those, those free fatty acids have a differing flavor quality and so Lipase can be important. Amylase. Oh, this one's fun. There's actually a whole bunch of different enzymes I'm going to talk about in this slide. In the case of making corn syrup, mm, corn is a, is a powerhouse in terms of all of the different applications that are being used. And if you drive around southern Ontario where we're located, corn is one of the most important field crops that we grow. In many cases, we're taking advantage of enzymes and processing that corn into a wide variety of different food ingredients or industrial ingredients. And one great example is corn syrup. And so what we're doing is we're purifying out the starch from that corn. We're making a corn slurry and then converting that slurry using amylase. So we're splitting off small dextrin particles using alpha amylase and then using a second enzyme, glucoamylase, we're taking those small dextrins and converting them into glucose. We can then use a third enzyme, glucose isomerase, and convert the glucose into fructose. And that's when we're seeing high fructose corn syrup. Now I know there's a lot of bad rap for high glucose or high fructose corn syrup right now because fructose in excess has some issues related to metabolic disease, diabetes, and um, lipid deposition within the, within the liver. But think about this, we're taking, we're taking starch and we're converting it into a sugar that is very, very um, sweet gram for gram as compared to glucose. And as such, fructose has a lot of interesting characteristics. Glucose on its own, very interesting. We could be stopping it here at glucose and fermenting it out to alcohol. And this whole powerhouse, we can take the glucose and convert it into a wide variety of other different um, molecules for industrial applications, citric acids, other, other um, organic acids, and so on. We can harness these enzymes to uh, create all sorts of different products and a lot of work is being done by industrial fermentation groups to be able to convert food uh, feedstocks into high value molecules for, uh, for industry, for food, for pharmaceuticals and so on. So think about it from that perspective. This is one of those examples, cellulase, um, taking something that's not terribly useful. Well, uh, uh, cellulosic material is quite useful, but can we convert cellulosic material into 
high value fermentation feedstock. Glucose is that magical high value fermentation feedstock. So how can we take large cellulose molecules, find efficient cellulases that break down that cellulose into exocellulase or, or into cellobios, pardon me, exocellulase is the enzyme, and then turn that cellobios into glucose. We're taking cellulose and breaking it down into glucose. If we can do that, then we can capture all of the power of a lot of the agricultural waste that's occurring out there. A lot of research is going on into this field, finding efficient endo and exocellobios is to be able to take agricultural feedstocks like corn stover or wood chips and be able to make glucose, which could be used for ethanol fuel production. Oh, here's a fun one. So sucrose. Sucrose is a disaccharide. And if we can somehow take that disaccharide, which really likes to be crystalline, and break it into its constituent monosaccharides, glucose and fructose, which don't like to crystallize, we could be taking advantage of the Cadbury secret and making fluid centers in chocolates. So what's happening in the case of a chocolate covered cherry with a liquid center, you've got a crystalline sucrose with just enough water around it, water of hydration, apply invertase, and slowly over time, the sugar goes from being crystalline into liquid. Invertase is a lot of fun. I'm trying to see if I can find some, and then we make some chocolate covered cherries as our end lab. Here's another enzyme, transglutaminase. This is where we're taking lysine and glutamine and using transglutaminase in particular, it will create this glu glutaminyl, lys er, la, la, glu glutaminyl lysine crosslinks across proteins. And transglutaminase was originally derived from blood. And you think about what's occurring in blood when you cut yourself. The transglutaminase is part of the whole clotting series of proteins that are in there. It's quickly forming this fibril network across the proteins in your blood. If we can purify out that transglutaminase, you can then cross-link any protein that you want. There's a joke um, in a lot of different kitchens that kitchens that are using transglutaminase, people will go and dust it on themselves when they cut themselves with a knife. But there's, there's some truth behind that. Transglutaminase can quickly be used because it is originally derived from the clotting factor of blood. And transglutaminase can be used by meat processing. But uh, those of you who took the earlier class with me and looked in the list of incorporation, it's used for restructuring a wide variety of different proteins in, in uh, non-standardized meats, in different comminuted meat products, and so on. Where it's sneaky is where food companies try and use substandard muscle protein and reconstitute it into muscle proteins and, and reposition those as steaks. One thing to do it for, like, let's say making uh, fake crab sticks or making surimi or making uh, head cheese or sausages, it's another thing to try and represent that as steak. Transglutaminase can be used in bread products as well to increase gluten strength and increase protein strength in low protein uh, doughs. Oh, here's another one where we're, we're actually breaking things down. Bromelain and papain are proteases. They are taking the polypeptides within proteins and you're breaking them down into polypeptide fragments. Bromelain is naturally found in pineapples. Papain is naturally found in papayas, but the isolated enzymes are commonly found in meat tenderizers. And so sprinkle a small amount on and the enzymes will break down the fibril proteins within stringy meats and create a more tender meat product. Leave the enzyme on too long and you end up with meat that gets dry and gritty when it cooks because you have lost all of the protein structure and the meat dries out too quickly. So I'm going to leave you with this uh, Michaela's Menten equation. The big take home from this is Think about if you're using different enzyme products within your, within your food uh, product development, that you really want to focus on the outcomes. And 
we've talked about in experimental de design the importance of documentation and the importance of looking at all the environmental variables. And so how do we change reaction rate? We change reaction rate by changing all of those other conditions, time and temperature, changing the salting conditions, changing uh, environmental variables. And so when we talk about the importance of this, so often students are like, oh, well, that's not important. I'm not really making a recipe. I'm not scaling things up. If we don't start practicing now at the bench scale, thinking about how long did my recipe sit out for? How, how warm is it in the environment? Or how cold is it in the environment? What's the relative humidity in the air today? All of these variables can impact on reaction rates of the different um, reactions that we're seeing within our food products. Everything is chemistry and all the different variables within the environment impact on that. And that's why I harp on my students so much saying, what's the environmental temperature today? How long did you let that rest for? Did you let it rest overnight or did you uh, mix it right away? But these are the sorts of variables that impact on the outcome of your product. In the case of food enzymes, they can impact on the reaction rate of your enzyme. And as such, you need to be really acutely aware of all of these. So I think that's it for this slideshow. And I've got uh, another slideshow coming up on um, measuring protein and how structure and function re uh, relates to that. As, as always, I love hearing your questions and we'll talk to you soon.